Hi everyone, this is Alicia Ford, your Pathways 15 Conference MC for day two of our event online. Welcome back to this afternoon's keynote presentation. Before I introduce our speaker, I would just let to, like to let you know some exciting news. All of yesterday, so day one of Pathways 15 presentations are already available online, the recordings. Many thanks to our teams at Attend and Adset for getting those up so promptly. So if you did miss anything yesterday or there was something absolutely fabulous that you would like to revisit, you are very welcome to check those out on the Attend website after today's, after this afternoon's keynote. And I'd now like to introduce you to our presenter, Helen Cook from MyPlus Consulting in the UK. Helen is the CEO of MyPlus Consulting and founder of the MyPlus Recruiters Club and MyPlus Universities Club. She is recognised nationally as a leading expert in disability and graduate recruitment. Helen works with organisations to provide them with the expertise to be disability confident in their strategy, their processes and their engagement. And realise the possibilities of hiring and retaining more people with a disability. Her clients include Barclays, EY, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, Linklaters and Teach First. Helen is also behind MyPlus Students Club, an innovative website which provides students with disabilities or long-term health conditions the advice, support and confidence to find opportunities, approach relevant organisations and go on to realise new possibilities with progressive employers. It also provides a platform for business to showcase themselves as disability confident employers. The uniqueness of Helen's approach comes from her expertise in HR and graduate recruitment combined with her first-hand experience of disability. Helen is a wheelchair user as a result of a childhood spinal injury. She started her career on the M&S Graduate Management Program before moving to Mars, where she spent 10 years, mostly in HR and resourcing, before setting up her business. In addition to her own experiences of disability, Helen has worked extensively with other disabled individuals. The majority of this experience comes from her involvement with the Backup Trust, an organisation which supports spinally injured individuals. Helen is a mentor for the Backup Mentoring Program and became a trustee in 2016. Helen is an associate member of the Business Disability Forum, is listed in the 2018 and 2020 Shaw Trust Disability Power 100 list, of most influential disabled people in the UK, and is a commissioner on Lord Shinkland's 2020 Disability Commission. I'll now hand over with pleasure to Helen to present this session. Thanks, Helen. Alicia, thank you very much. Lovely, lovely introduction. Um, as Alicia said, I'm, I'm the CEO and founder of, of My Plus, and I'm absolutely delighted to be um, joining you for your afternoon. It's our morning, it's five o'clock in the morning here, so it was a very early start. I'm obviously delighted to be here. I'm delighted that, you've, uh, you, that you're joining us. So our vision at MyPlus is to ensure that having a disability doesn't prevent anyone from having the career that they want to have. And this is something that I'm particularly passionate about as a wheelchair user who I have been fortunate enough to have had an enjoyable career since I graduated many moons ago. Now, in terms of what we're going to be looking at today, it is all about disability and, and employment. And we're just going to sort of look at the, the landscape of, of disability employment before then moving on to look at what we term the five pillars of disability confidence on campus, which are understanding the employment challenges facing this group, um, my plus, identifying your strengths. We're going to talk about that horrible term disclosure and the benefits of being open and how to be open with an employer. We're going to talk about applying for a job with a disability and accounting for differences on your CV. And we're going to talk about requesting adjustments. And just to say that during um, this presentation, I'm going to use the word disability officer as a generic term, as an all encompassing term for, for the roles that you do. Um, and I guess how the, the, the student would, 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 would view you. So before we kick off any further, we're going to have our first poll question, which David, you're going to, to run for me. And the question here is, what percentage of students in, in, with a disability said that they did consult their disability officer about their careers? 
33%, or 92%. So David, over to you to, to run this, please. Sorry, it's Darlene here, Helen. We're having a bit of trouble back in the back end in trying to get the interpreter up and you. So David was on the phone to Jane. So David, are you off the phone now? And can you um, please put the poll up? I'm back. I'm putting the poll up now. Great. Thank you. Sorry, Helen. So the question is, what percent of students with a disability said that they did consult the disability officer about careers? 33%, 56% or 92% and I'm just launching that out to the audience now. And Helen, we'll just wait a little moment while the results come back in. At the moment we're at about 40% returned from the audience. For audience members who are in a browser, you may not see the polling option, um, and I'll release the results in about 20 seconds or so. Okay, Helen, so it looks like the early result is in, and it's 33% um, at 86% of respondents, so the primary belief or the answer is um, the first one, 33%. Okay, thanks, David. Um, I have to say that um, you're way off track. Uh, in the research that we did a few years ago, um, it was 92%, 92% of students said that they would speak to their disability officer about careers, and actually that was a much higher uh, percentage than those who said that they would speak to their careers advisor, which was around 50 to 52 percent. So I think that's, that's a really important statistic to, to just remember. And I think that this comes from the fact that the relationship the student has with their disability officer is such a trusted relationship. And they're going to talk to you about these things, whereas they don't necessarily know their career officer in the same way that, that they know you. So let's let's move on. We're now going to talk about um, disability and employment. And then, you know, you might have been thinking, well, what's that got to do with me? You know, I, I'm I'm not involved in careers. However, not only do we now know that over ninety percent of, of students are going to talk to you about their careers, um, but supporting students to enjoy, to develop employability skills goes way beyond the remit of the career service. And key reasons that students go to university is either they want to pursue a particular career or they want to get, to get a better job than perhaps they think they would have done if they hadn't gone to university. And that's true for students whether or not they have a disability. Yet it remains considerably harder for students with a disability to um, obtain employment upon graduating than it does for their non-disabled counterparts. And the reasons for this are many and varied, and we're going to come on to that. However, if we are serious about removing those barriers that prevent individuals from finding employment, uh, we have to recognise that employability teams, disability teams, and indeed all key support services across the university um, are gonna have to work together to provide the advice and guidance that's required. But before I move on to look at the stats around disability employment, I just wanted to remind ourselves about the importance of work. Obviously, um, money is, is important, but I, I tend to say I, I think it's just a housekeeping factor. Employment is so important, and we know that when we are excluded from that, um, it has a huge impact on us, and it has, particularly has a huge impact on our mental health. Work gives us a purpose. It gives us our reason to get up in the morning. It develops our self-worth. It's how we contribute to society. People ask, you know, what do you do? And if you, if you don't do anything, it's very hard to, to be part of something. And being at work, being part of a team, creates that sense of belonging. And I think for me as well, one of the really key and th important things is that it provides our social interaction. And when I think about like, some of who my closest friends are, um, I've made them through work. 
And indeed, I've continued to meet amazing people um, since setting up my class and the work that I've done here. So work is so important and nobody, as we all know, should be excluded from that. And I'm not just necessarily talking about full-time uh, paid work. This could be part-time work, this could be voluntary work, but it's about, as I said, it's about this whole work essence um, and what it provides us with. So let's just have a look at what's um, happening in the world of employment for um, students with disabilities. Well, we know that an increasing number of students at university have a disability, and we know that they find it harder to find employment when they graduate than their non-disabled counterparts. We know that students can find it more difficult to gain work experience than their non-disabled counterparts. And recent research also found that 76% of students don't want to disclose their disability to an employer. Now we're gonna come on to that, but that's a really important statistic, not least with it's a huge barrier, because not only um, are some individuals so concerned to be open, that they're actually they're taking themselves out of the recruitment process altogether. Others are applying, but because they don't want to share information about their disability, they're hitting a barrier in the recruitment process and they're being rejected. And they're being rejected for roles that actually they're more than capable of doing. So this whole issue of, of disclosure, and I don't like that term, I'm gonna come on to that, it is a massive, is a massive issue. Some students with disabilities believe that their disability will be seen as a weakness by an employer. And that's a term that they've used with me a lot in the, in the work that we've done. And indeed, some students see their own disability as a weakness, something that I, I find incredibly hard um, to, to hear when, when, when people talk about that. So these are the facts, but, but how do we address them? So at my plus, what we did is that we identified five pillars of, of disability confidence as being absolutely crucial in terms of being able to provide that expert careers advice that um, students with disabilities require. And it is expert careers advice because whilst yes, students with disabilities have got the same questions and concerns about careers and applying for jobs as those without a disability, because of our disability, we've got this other whole swathe of challenges that I've just outlined for you going on. And we need expert careers advice to, to be able to address those. And I think that um, what one of the, the things that's happening at the moment is that they're getting inconsistent advice. Different people are telling them different things. It's coming from careers advisors. It's coming from um, academic staff. It's coming from disability advisors. It's coming from parents. And what we've got to do is we've got to get on the same page and we've got to provide the consistent advice to these guys. So I think it's worth, um, so, so it's in terms of what we're going to do now, we're going to look at these five pillars of disability confidence. And these are understanding the employment challenges that face students with disability. We're going to look at my plus. We're going to look at the whole subject of disclosure. We're going to look at applying for uh, a, a job with a disability and accounting for differences on your application and we're going to be talking about requesting adjustments. So first of all let's start with understanding the employment challenges, pillar one. I think first of all it's worth just reminding ourselves that finding um, a job is, is difficult for anyone and rejection is part of the course regardless of whether or not you have a disability. And it's very easy to blame our disability. You know, the reason I didn't get a job was because of my disability, but it's not most of the time. It's simply because it's a really competitive field and there are better candidates out there. But as I said, um, having a disability can make this harder and we need to understand what those challenges are and we need to be able to help our students to address these challenges. So let's just have a look at what the bar barriers and challenges are. So first of all, let's start with, with lack of confidence. I think some individuals really lack the confidence to apply for jobs, believing that employers aren't interested in them. And maybe they've been led to believe that a career isn't for them, it's not going to be possible by their teachers or by their parents. It may be that they've recently acquired their disability and they've had a huge knock in confidence as a result of that. Or it may be that they're comparing themselves to others. I think it's human nature to compare ourselves to others 
and to see what we can't do or no longer do or going to find difficult doing. And as a result of that, it leads me on to that second point here is that as a result of that comparison, they see themselves as a weaker candidate. Um, and not surprisingly, if they see themselves as a weaker candidate because of their disability, it leads them on to this question about, should I be open about my disability? Should I inform uh, an employer about my disability? And as I said, it, this is a huge question, and which we're gonna come on to look at in a bit more depth. But if you don't, um, if you're not open about your disability, it's very difficult to get the support that you potentially need during the recruitment process. Not surprisingly, I, you know, people with disabilities fear discrimination. I tell me, you don't want me, you're gonna find a reason to take me out of the, the, the recruitment process. And often they um, may have what I call differences in their CV. Again, we're gonna come on to this, perhaps a gap in their education. They may have lower grades, they may be lacking work experience. And actually, how do we account for these and how do we do so in a way that's positive and is not going to lead to automatic rejection? Not surprisingly, I think another barrier are the judgments and assumptions and perceptions that we tend to believe that people are going to have about us. And let's face it, they don't really tend to be very positive. And finally, I think there's the, the challenge of requesting support and adjustments. It's hard to ask for something that seemingly no one else is asking for. And we fear that we're going to be seen as a, as a hassle um, or we're going to be seen as causing a fuss. And again, it's just another reason that we're giving the employer to take us out of the recruitment process. But again, if we don't request that support, potentially we're going to be rejected. So how do individuals overcome these, these challenges? Well, it's not easy. Um, I'm not saying that there's a, an easy answer to this, but as I said, I do believe that universities have a collective responsibility to work with individuals to help them to overcome these barriers and also to challenge perceptions of, of what's possible. So key, first of all, is getting fully involved in university life in order to develop employability skills. Employers look for a lot more than just good academics. They look for leadership skills. They look for initiative. They look for people skills. They look for people that have got involved in things. And you can only do this if you get fully involved in university life. But actually, when you're managing your disability or when you lack your life confidence, it can be very difficult to get involved with clubs and societies to take on positions of responsibility and get involved in voluntary work. That's not to say you can't do it, but we need to encourage these individuals to do that. Individuals need to be able to position their disability positively. It's very easy, as I said, to think about the things that we can't do or can no longer do. But instead, we need to think about the extra skills and abilities and attributes that we develop as a result of managing our disability on a day to day basis in a world that's not always geared up to it. To it. And I'm going to come on to that. I think it can also help to prepare an openness statement. So I said one of the biggest challenges is how do we inform an employer about a disability to get the support we need? And as I've already shared with you, um, over 76% of individuals don't want to be open about their disability. But actually preparing an openness statement is going to make it easier. It's not going to make it easy, but it's going to make it easier. And individuals need to find a way to share this information because for most of us, our disability isn't going to go away. And they need to become an expert in what they need in the, in the support and adjustments. It's not always easy. Um, our disabilities fluctuate. It might be newly acquired. We may not have applied to companies before, but we need to become an expert in what we need and to be able to articulate that to an employer. And finally, we need to be able to gain work experience. We need to take part in internships and we need to take part in placement opportunities, just like those without a disability do. And again, as I said, I know this isn't easy, but we shouldn't be taking ourselves out of this remit to start with. There's absolutely no reason why you're not able to do this. It's, there's gonna be some challenges, but we need to believe that we can. So now that we understand some of these challenges, let's move on to the other four pillars, which um, are all designed in some way to build our confidence to address these, these, um, these challenges. So the first pillar is, is my plus, 
And I guess it's very much the essence of, of who we are. And I always say, I don't believe that I'm any more special than anyone else because of my disability, but I do believe it's given me something extra. It's given me a plus. And as I said, those are the skills and the strengths and the abilities that I've had to develop to manage my disability on a day-to-day -day basis in a world that's not always geared up for it. It's my determination to overcome the barriers that are in front of me. It's the problem solving to get around the daily challenges, particularly around access. And it's the interpersonal skills to build relationships with others, particularly when I need them to assist me. And if I just give you, um, you know, an example of that, I, I, live in, uh, I, I live in Windsor, which is west of London. Um, and before lockdown, we were, which I used to travel into London probably two or three times a week. And we've got a small unmanned station at, at, at Windsor. And the challenges start with, is there gonna be accessible parking? Uh, the stations by a school and the parents tend to use their, the accessible parking spaces just to drop their kids off just for a few minutes. But in that time, I've clearly missed my train. Um, it's an unmanned station, so I have to wonder whether I'm going to, the guard is going to come out and get me onto a train. Uh, we're still using old fashioned ramps onto trains here in the UK. Um, are they going to remember to get me off the train when I get to Waterloo in London? Are the lifts going to be working around the, the Jubilee line? Are the taxi drivers going to be helpful to get me into the car? You know, are the, are the toilets going to be unlocked? Are they going to be full of cleaning equipment or baby high chairs? You know, these are the day-to-day -day challenges that I, that I have to get around. And not surprisingly, therefore, I develop these skills and, and, and abilities to get around them, because otherwise I'm going to be really stuck, believe me. And just a few more examples here. These are some of the students that I've worked with. So Rosie has what she terms upper limb deficiency. Her, her arm finishes, um, her left arm finishes uh, at the elbow. And she says, you know, I'm very good at problem solving as through my life, I've had to come up with alternative ways to complete physical tasks. And when she talks about what her plus is, she talks about appearing calm and positive under pressure. Because it's always important to her that people don't perceive her to be struggling on account of her upper limb difference. And she says in that way, even when I'm focused, I'm facing challenges, I habitually exude confidence. And then we have Will who has obsessive compulsive disorder. And he says he thinks it's helped him to build his resilience. Coming to terms with his condition has led to a greater sense of perspective. And he also is very organized since knowing when things need to be done by, relieves and reduces his anxiety so he can prepare for it. And it also leads to effective prioritization of tasks and deadlines. Now, if you just take those two individuals, we've got you know, appearing calm under pressure, exuding confidence, building resilience, being organized you know these are all the types of things that you see um on a on a, on a job, job advert with all the types of skills and strengths that the employer is looking for and therefore we need to be working with our students to help them to identify their plus so this pillar is all about encouraging your students to identify their plus and building their confidence as they begin to focus on their unique skills and abilities and working out how they can stand out for the right reasons and the positive reasons. And to help them to do this, I'd firstly encourage them to identify four or five strengths that they actually possess. And for each of these, to develop examples or a story to illustrate each, each of the strengths. They can then differentiate themselves from the other candidates by identifying unique strengths that are unique to them as a result of their disability. But they do need to be accurate and they need to ensure that the strengths they identify are ones they actually possess rather than ones that are simply asked for in the job description. To um, move on to talk about encouraging openness. Now, we often talk about disclosure. Um, I know many of us are trying not to use this term anymore. I think it makes it sound like we've got this horrible secret um, that we're sort of keeping under our hat. And we tend to talk about openness, informing, sharing information. Um, Having said that, if you go onto our website, you will see that we use the word disclosure. And the reason for that is that we went through the whole of the website removing it because it's not a term I like, but it's what students Google. So we had, we had to put it on. Now, before we, before we move in on any further, um, David, I hope you're still there. And we're going to move on to our second poll question. I'm so here this time. <laughs> fantastic. 
So um, in, in, in research that we carried out, um, what percentage of students with a disability said that they were concerned to inform an employer about their disability? 54%, 65% or 76%. Thanks, Helen. I'm just sending that out to the audience now. And we're just over half voted now. So I'll wait another couple of moments and then I'll let you know. Oh, this is an interesting result. So with 70% uh, returned, 66% uh, of people believe that it is the bottom statistic, 76%. Well, they're spot on, um, which I would expect, but I did actually give it away earlier on, that shows that, shows that people are listening, which is great. So yes, 76%, and that's an awful lot of fear. And as I said, that's, um, that's important for two, or, or, or stands out for, for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> One is that for some individuals, it's actually stopping them um, applying for jobs in the first place. When we did the focus groups around this, some students said, I'm just not ready to go there. I, I, I'm not applying for jobs. And others said, um, I, you know, I, 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 I am going to be open, but I'm really concerned to do it. So let's have a look at what these concerns are. Well, not surprisingly, one of the biggest concerns was this fear of discrimination, as I said, I tell you, you don't want me, you're gonna take me out of your process. They don't want to cause a fuss or a hassle. I think, as I said, finding a job is hard for anyone. Um, and particularly graduate recruitment is incredibly competitive. And in the last nine months, it's become even more so. And actually we don't want to give the employer any reason to, to take them out of that process and actually to seemingly be asking for something that no one else is asking for, is what I believe as a student, I think I'm causing a fuss or a hassle. The fact that, you know, well, in the UK, it's 14% of students in UK universities, that's one in seven, has a disability. And I suspect it's similar in Australia, whether or not they're open about it. You know, actually, there's an awful lot of people that are asking for support, but it's very easy to think we're the only one. People don't want to appear different in front of other candidates. Um, they might be ashamed or embarrassed by the disability. They may not see their condition as a disability. They may not relate to that. Um, equally, they may not require an adjustment. So if I don't need you to do anything for me, why am I going to fear discrimination or to cause a fuss or a hassle? I'm just not going to, 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 to tell you at this point. And then finally, this fear of favourable treatment. So in the same way that I don't want to be discriminated against, I certainly don't want to be your token hire. So I'm just not going to put myself out there. So a lot, an awful lot of fear. And, and how do we help students to, to overcome these? Well, there's three things that I would suggest we look at, which is the what, the when, and the how. So what is it that we need to tell an employer? When do we do it? And what's the best way of going about it? So let's just start with the what. I always say to students, only state what's relevant. You don't need to go into your whole medical history, not least this employer is not medically trained and they're not going to understand that. Instead, just talk about what is the support and adjustments that you need during the recruitment process. We're not talking about the actual workplace here. This is just the recruitment process. So what support or adjustments do you need during the recruitment process to enable you to demonstrate your full potential? And what you also need to be prepared to do is to talk about why you want that support. So it's not sufficient just to say, I'd like extra time or um, uh, I, I need um, an orientation visit or I need to take breaks you've got to explain what it will enable you to do. So why are you asking for that? So if you have dyslexia, um, it, it's around you know, the extra time will allow me to process that information. In terms of when, I would ideally say as early as possible in the recruitment process, giving the employer plenty of time to put those adjustments in place. But equally, you may decide 
to wait until you've been invited to the interview. It's something that I learned, something I decided when, when, I, was, when I was looking for, for roles that actually I didn't want to put anything on my application form that um, stated that I was had a disability because I wanted them to recruit me 100% on merit. I wanted to either be recruited, you know, invited for an interview um, because of my skills and competencies, not because I have a disability or not to be rejected because I have a disability. So you may decide I'm going to wait until I've been invited for an interview. Equally, many um, recruitment processes have a number of stages and you may decide only to um, be open at the stage that you require support. So as a wheelchair user, I wouldn't need to say anything for telephone interview or for online tests. I wouldn't need to say anything unless I was being invited for a face-to-face -face interview, at which point I'd be talking about, about access. And then in terms of how to be open, well, again, there's different ways of doing this. You could put this on the application form. You could put it in the covering letter. You could do it as part of that personal statement that people often write on their, on their CVs. Um, you may, as I said, decide not to have anything on your application or covering letter because you want to be judged and, and know that you've been judged 100% of merit. And therefore, um, you decide to do it by phone or email, as I said, once perhaps that interview comes through. Most important for me, is to remember to position your disability positively. When I say that, it's about, you know, it, it's a fact. I, I, I am a wheelchair user. Um, you may want to say, you know, but as a result of that, I've developed certain skills and strengths that I believe are going to be um, pertinent to the role. But don't use words like, you know, unfortunately, or sadly, or suffering. They're, they've all got negative connotations. And what we want them to do is we want them to be thinking about Actually, how am I going to stand out positively? So that's the what, the when, the how. And the other thing that I, I really recommend um, individuals doing is writing what we call an openness statement. Now, I always say that for, for most individuals, um, their disability is not going to go away. Um, and therefore, we have to find a way of informing an employer about what we need in a way that we feel comfortable with. And actually by giving it some thought and write, writing an openness statement, it makes this whole process easier. And again, I take a three step approach to this. So what I do is when I'm working with students, I get them to choose a few words for each of the following, going back to what we've talked about before. This is my disability or condition. Um, this is what it means for the recruitment process. And this is what I'm gonna need. If we start off just breaking it down into those three things, we can then turn those words into a short, sharp, um, a short, succinct openness statement. And then I say to them, practice, I want you to practice it until you love it. And when I've got a room full of students, I get them to stand up and practice with each other. Um, and most of them do it. I always give them the opt out, they don't want to, but you can see their confidence grow and I always say, you know, practice it, do it in front of the bathroom mirror, your parents, your career advisor, your disability manager, your parents, whoever you feel trust, you, you, you trust, and get some feedback on this. Because once you feel confident with it, um, you're going to feel confident to share it. And I just want to give a few examples. What, what, what on earth am I talking about here? Probably one of the questions going on in your mind. So just a few examples. The first one, I have dyslexia. I will need 25% extra time, and this will allow me to process the information I've been given. As I said, short, sharp, succinct statement. Second one, I experience anxiety. I would like an orientation visit prior to my interview and for the interviewing managers to know that I may become more anxious than others. Often when I speak to individuals with anxiety, depression, hidden disability, well, anxiety, depression, they're sort of saying, well, I'm not sure what it is I want the employer to do. And sometimes I say, would it just be helpful if there was some understanding, I have some understanding that I might get more anxious than, other, than, than others. And you can see, yeah, actually that's, that, that would be useful. And then the final, final one, I'm on medication for my health condition. Um, I would like, to sh like my interview to be scheduled for the afternoon. And this will allow the effects of my medication to have worn off. 
So you don't even have to go into the ins and outs of what your, your condition is. They haven't said what the condition is. They've just stated, I have a health condition. So I really urge you to work with your students to, to get them to write this openness statement, because once they've got something, they will find it so much easier to be able to put that out there. And it gets one of the, the worries, as it were, uh, 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 away for them. Now, pillar four, we're going to move on to talk about positioning your differences um, positively with an employer. When I say differences, I'm talking to mitigating circumstances. And the common ones for individuals with a disability when it comes to employment it are, um, they might have a gap in their education when they were um, perhaps diagnosed with a disability or had to spend some time in hospital or just um, managing their disability at a period of ill health. They may have lower academics um, because of that gap in their education or because of the impact that the disabilities have, perhaps on their ability to carry out um, exams. Or they may have a lack of work experience. Um, a disability is not an excuse for not trying to get work experience, but we know it can be harder. And employers will take genuine mitigating circumstances relating to their disability into consideration. Key word there is, is genuine. Um, students often say to me, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm telling a sob story. If, it, if they're genuine mitigating circumstances, they will be taken into consideration. And again, I would take a three step approach to this um, by stating um, you know, what, what's the fact, what's the situation, what was the implication, and actually what happened as a result of that. Remembering that we want to position our disability, position our disability positively with an employer. Sorry, as I said, it's very early in the UK, getting my teeth wrapped around these words here. And we want to do that positively. So the first one here, and these are all genuine, uh, real examples was a student who lost 50% of his vision in his first year at university. I took two years out of university, but during that time, I developed adaptability, confidence, and resilience. Somebody with lower um, academics states the fact I had and I experienced anxiety and panic attacks. Um, I experienced panic attacks during exams, leading to lower grades. I didn't fail the exam, and so couldn't retake them. And I'd just like to ask you to please take this into consideration. And finally, a lack of work experience. I have a disability. I haven't obtained work experience, but actually I've developed communication and influencing skills as a result of my disability, as well as planning and organization skills. That goes back to the whole premise of, of my class. So as you can see where we're coming from here, it's just very much sort of um, talking about these mitigating circumstances in a very matter of fact way. This is what happened. This is what the impact is. This is what I want to, you to take into consideration. And again, taking this three-step approach with individuals will make it an awful lot easier. So it's exactly the same as we did with our openness statement. We're gonna do this with mitigating circumstances. And then the, the final pillar is identifying your strengths. And I have talked a little bit about this um, already. And this is about, um, sorry, the final pillar is not identifying your strengths. We've had that. The final pillar is um, requesting adjustments and support. And there's three, when it comes to um, the interview process, a number of students, majority of students, are going to need um, adjustments or support during the recruitment process. As I said, and without that adjustments and support, potentially they're going to be rejected for, for roles. And what we want to do here is to encourage individuals to become experts in what they need and to be able to articulate that to the employer. And I'm not saying it's easy because actually if you haven't been through a recruitment process before, or if your disability is newly acquired, you're not going to know necessarily what it is that you need. But I really urge individuals to become an expert in this because again, going forward, it will make it easier. And I would say there's three steps to working out what you need during the recruitment process. So first of all, step one is finding out what the recruitment process involves. 
from the application form through to online tests, the video interview or the assessment centre. And that information may be on the website or actually it might be harder for, to, to find and they're going to have to liaise with the um, employer to find out what that process is. Once you know what the process is, for each stage of the process, they need to identify what support and adjustments you will need in order to demonstrate your full potential. So actually, if it's an online test, what do I need? Do I need more time? Do I need um, the test in a different format? Do I need um, uh, uh, questions in advance? I don't know what it's going to be. Do I need use of technology so that the, the font's bigger? What is it that I need to be able to allow me to take those tests? And once you've identified the, um, what you need for each stage of the process, step three is to discuss those requirements with the employer, um, not just to agree what you need at each stage, but also to identify any other support that you might not have identified personally. So those are the three steps. But the other thing that I would just like to, to point out here is that personally, I think it's really, really important that the individual takes ownership for this that the individual is starting their relationship with the employer and they're the person that is going to have these conversations with the employer, not you, not the career advisor and certainly not their parent. It's really important that they develop the confidence to have the conversations with, with the um, employer themselves. So we've now gone through the five pillars of disability confidence. I just want to remind you what they are. It's about understanding the employment challenges that these individuals are faced with. It's about helping them to identify their strengths so that they stand out from the crowd in a positive way. It's about um, developing their openness statement, understanding the benefits of being open and how they could be open with an employer. It's about accounting for differences on their CV, and it's about requesting the adjustments that they need. Just before I finish, um, I am conscious that I've gone through an awful lot of information and I just want to talk to you uh, very briefly about our Be Disability Confident on Campus Toolkit. Now, we developed this um, uh, earlier this year. Um, what we realised was, was that we need to take this consistent approach to supporting students. And one of the ways to do this is to have a toolkit that we can all dip into, whether we're a disability officer or whether we're a careers advisor. And the aim of this toolkit is to help people to understand what the challenges are facing students with disabilities and to raise awareness across all student support services and academic departments. It's about developing everyone's ability to provide that expert career guidance and guidance, even if it's just at a, at a, at a, at a light touch. It's about being able to provide your students with consistent advice and guidance and ultimately, it's about enabling all of your students to be able to successfully transition into employment. And in the toolkit, we've got um, a webinar training um, pack um, that can be used with the staff to upskill all staff. We've got what we call our conversation cards that you can see there in the top right of your screen, um, touching on, on these different topics, because we often find that students will come to you with a certain conversation, a certain topic that they want to um, discuss and actually how do we frame this conversation and we also have four digital training packs that you can use with your students to run workshops on disclosure applying with a disability and accounting for differences accessing support and identifying strengths and we've got those along with um, train trainer guides um, and we've got more information of that on our universities club uh, website and actually we're just offering a, a special deal for attend conference participants for just 2,500 US um, Australian dollars. So please do drop me a line if, if you want um, some more information on this because it will really, really support your students as they transition into employment. Alicia here, Helen. We've got just under 15 minutes left and it's been such an informative presentation as always. Thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A box and the chat box. Would you like to go into those now? Yeah, that's perfect timing because I uh, have finished that presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can.
Uh, if you, I, I will work out how to, sh to stop sharing my screen if you want to start asking questions. Sure, thank you, Helen. So the first question that has come through is just asking whether you have any specific advice for those job seekers who have a psychotic um, disability or disorder, as so many people are fearful of such disorders. I think it's about, I mean, a really good question. I think it's about perhaps understanding why people are fearful. So actually understanding what, what that fear is. Um, I think, I'd, but I think actually I, I'd probably move away from that and to um, concentrate on positively positioning your disability. So, you know, yes, um, I have bipolar or um, whatever the condition is, but as a result of that, I've developed my, my resilience my self-awareness, um, my understanding of others. So I would be concentrating on positioning your disability positively rather than, dare I say, or, and, 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 uh, than maybe I was gonna say playing to people's fears, but, but actually I think, I think educated people are not fearful of them. I think those, you know, I'd say in the UK, the tabloid headlines, so I'd almost move away from that and, and concentrate on actually how do I po positively position this and concentrate on the skills that you do have that are relevant to the role. But equally, if somebody wants to talk more about, you know, what, what it means, um, you know, to be, to be able to perhaps, you know, I guess, demonstrate that empathy about why, they, why that fear is there and to, and to address that fear and, and perhaps to give them the, you know, the, the factual approach to this. Fantastic response. Thanks so much, Helen. I just as a person who has a background working in the mental health sector, um, I've met so many people with quite significant psychosocial disability. And I think you're right, it's, it's reframing uh, the, the narrative for themselves uh, and, and reframing that in such a way that is positive because so much of their lives has been framed in a negative narrative, um, whether that's self-talk or imposed by others. So Fabulous to hear that the, the tips and strategies that you advise certainly can, can I, be framed that positive. Can I just add to that? So a, a few years ago, I was at a, an event that a, a very large, one of the big four employers was running students with disabilities. And I got talking to a girl who wasn't hugely participating. And long story short, um, she told me that she um, was, I, I can't remember her condition, you use the word psych psychotic, but I guess in, in that um, it, 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 she had she had poor mental health and she was concerned. And her words to me was that if I tell the employer, they're going to think I'm violent. And I had a really interesting conversation because I said, I don't think they will. This, this is an educated company and you won't be the only person in this organisation that has that condition. These companies employ, you know, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people worldwide, you won't be the only person in this organization that has that disability. And I think there's also something for me about, actually, if you can be open about it up front, as you say, with frame your narrative, depending, you know, it's interesting therefore for you then to see what response you get. Because if you don't get a positive response, you have to question, do I want to work for them? And it's probably better that you know that up front. Absolutely, Helen, I couldn't agree with you more. And I've had that exact conversation with people, you know, is that who you want to work for? Is that the culture of an organisation that you aspire to be a part of? So I think that's a really key point as well. We do have another question from our audience. This one is from Liz, I think it was, and apologies if I've got that wrong. The question is, I've noticed in recent years, many interview and recruitment processes have changed that are not commensurate with con conditions such as anxiety. For example, online interviews, the speed dating style of interviewing and so forth. What do you suggest as strategies to work with students if you know that this is likely to be the process they will face? For me, this goes back to the whole requesting adjustments and support piece, which is for them to
find out what the process is. And, you know, processes are different. Different companies do have different processes. And then to identify what is it, you know, what is it that I need? So actually, if, for example, um, I'm going to an assessment centre, let's just pretend that lockdown isn't happening anymore. Um, and it's going to be a group discussion and I have a hearing impairment. Actually, what does that mean for me? And, and again, you might say, well, I, I can I can do the group discussion, but I'm going to need my interpreter or I'm going to need um, uh, questions in advance, which might not work. And therefore, then you can talk to the employer about um, actually how we find a way around this. Um, and the employer won't, you know, the employer is likely to have had this before. So it might be that they decide to um, replace that group discussion with another interview or they might do it as a role play. Or we've had companies in the UK where they've used um, managers to sit in as, as, as delegates instead. But it's about um, working with the employer to work out, OK, this is the bit that I'm going to find difficult. How do we get around it? Key for me, though, is whatever you do, don't just say, can I not do it? Because a recruitment process, all those parts of that recruitment process are there for a reason. And if you say, well, I can't do the tests, and they say, well, that's fine, don't do it. As soon as you're rejected, you know, you're going to turn around and say, well, you didn't give me as many opportunities to demonstrate my potential as everyone else. And equally, if you aren't rejected, no one's going to turn around and say, well, you got an easy ride of it. You didn't have to do all of it. So if there's part of the process that you can't do, work with the employer to work out what you do instead. But it's really important that you do do all of it. Don't just, don't just think I'll sit it out. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Helen. I think that's a really key point, isn't it? You know, you want to be a part of the entire process. So, so the question is really, what is that process or that part of the process trying to assess or understand about me and my attributes that make me a good fit for the role? And how can I do that in a different way? Or, or what examples perhaps can I give the employer to demonstrate that I've been able to do this previously in a different context? So Absolutely. wonderful advice. There's some great, there's no more questions coming through, but there are some great comments in our chat box from the audience. Um, and, and one in particular that I'd really like to share with you, uh, which is such an informative session, Helen. Thank you for your enlightened, compre comprehensive presentation as well. I'm so appreciative of the wealth and tools I've taken away. We've had other people talk to us about the transferability of your presentation to education settings, and in particular, your strengths-based and outcomes-focused approach. So many thanks for being with us this morning. In particular, I appreciate how early you've had to get up to be here. We're ending our day as yours is beginning, so I hope you can head off and have a, a really nice cup of coffee and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you ever so much, and um, thank you very much for, for inviting me to be part of your conference. And, and I hope that um, the next few days are, 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 are continue to be as good as you've told me the first few days have been. So thank you very much for having me. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Helen. And before our participants leave us this afternoon, I would like to just give you a, a quick wrap up of the day. I think we have had such a full and insightful day um, today as we did yesterday. Uh, what wonderful bookends to our day in the panel discussion facilitated by Dr. Paul Harper this morning. Some of my key takeaways from that were around the importance of genuine and authentic consultation with all stakeholders and the importance of engagement with an ownership of our institutional leadership teams in developing and implementing our disability action plans. Through our streams, um, stream one, looking at person-centred and tailored and targeted supports around employment, and stream two, which really showcased innovations, agility and collaborations um, to respond particularly to the challenges of COVID-19 and all that we've faced in 2020. And, and now to finish with you, Helen, um, from My Plus Consulting in the UK, some of the things that I really took away from your session were the things that the importance of understanding the things that stu students need to do, but also what they fear and how we can support them to put their best self forward to be competitive in an open employment market. So thank you to all of our participants. Thank you to our captioners from Bradley Reporting. Thank you to our interpreters from Deaf Services and the Deaf Society. 
and many thanks to our presenters as well as all of the people supporting in the back end of the webinars and the Zoom meeting sessions throughout the day. Um, it's very much a team effort and collaboration is very much a theme of this conference. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Don't forget to tweet your experiences of the Pathways 15 conference by using the hashtag Pathways 15. And if you haven't already, they might be closing off now for the day, but from 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time tomorrow, our exhibitor rooms will be open. You can access the links for those pages um, on your conference delegates page. Thank you and good evening.